Tonight we're continuing on through Luke 17. We only got through the first 10 verses last week, but during that time we looked at the first two of some lessons that Jesus was trying to teach to his disciples in order to prepare them for ministry after Christ. Now he knew at some point, and he probably knew more than at some point, he knew he was going to be uh, betrayed, he was going to be arrested, he was going to be tried, and he was going to be hung on a cross, and then after th three days he was going to be risen from the dead again. And then at some point beyond that, 40 days after, he was going to be uh, ascended into heaven, and the disciples now had to figure out how they're going to do church on their own. Now, as we know, they figured it out. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here right now. But at that point, they weren't even thinking beyond the, the fact that, oh, wow, Jesus is here, and he's, he's headed toward Jerusalem, and they're thinking in many ways that, hey, this is a great idea. We're going to, this kingdom's going to be established, and we're going to talk about that today, but not in the way that they thought it was going to be. But they weren't ready for ministry. Yeah, they'd gone on a couple of little mission trips, shall we say, you know, healed people, cast out demons, but they still just didn't get it. As we read in other Gospels, uh, Peter, when he, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to be died, you know, I'm going to die and I'm going to be crucified, and they forgot the rest of it and I'm going to be raised from the dead. But this tearing that first part, Peter comes up and says, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. And, God, and Jesus' response was, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? You don't know what you're talking about. And so there's a lot of preparation that's happening, and this was the kind of the first part of it. So we looked at lessons in forgiveness. Should we forgive people, you know, seven times or seven times seven or 70 times seven, depending on, on which gospel you read? And it's like, well, should we? Yes, the answer is yes. And sometimes the disciples themselves are thinking, well, I'm going to be big. I'm going to forgive someone 490 times if you do the math. You know, and Jesus said, that's still not enough. Always forgive. He also looked at some, uh, we looked at a lesson on faithfulness. And just how much faith really is important in doing ministry. Okay? And as, you know, if we, as, depending on when the Lord leads me to, when we do a study on the book of Revelation, one of the seven churches in Asia, the church in Ephesus, Jesus says, gives all these glowing reviews. Oh, yeah, you do this and you do that and you hate evil and you don't let anything come in. But, and I always hate it when someone's talking to me and they're telling me about something, but, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And basically you're saying you're not using that faith you had from the beginning. You don't have that love you had. You're just now going through the motions. Yeah, you're doing some great stuff, but the motivation behind what you're doing is not right. And he gives them a warning about it. And that was kind of like what he, a lot of the stuff he was covering last week. We also talked about, you know, stumbling. You know, don't do anything that's going to stumble somebody. When in doubt, don't do it. Okay, that's kind of a saying I had for years. My kids hate it. Because it's like, you know, well, well, should I do this or should I do that? When in doubt, don't do it. Okay? If you think it's going to bring shame to Christ, don't do it. If it's going to make a weaker Christian stumble, don't do it. Okay? And, you know, we had talked all sorts of things of not just eating or drinking or just your behavior in person, but even stuff that you post on Facebook. Okay? Or in social media or someplace that the world sees it and they're scratching their heads and saying, I thought that person was a Christian. Don't do it. If in doubt, don't do it. Well, this week, we have two more lessons. Okay? One is a lesson on thankfulness. Okay? How to be truly thankful. And, of course, on preparedness. Okay? You need to be ready. And this is one, in Luke, this is the first glimpse we get of the second coming. Okay? Jesus hasn't really talked a lot about it yet because he hasn't even been finished with his first coming. But now he's going to start talking about it. And 
of course, the parallel passage, if you're familiar with it, is Matthew 24. They're not sure if this is the same here or just a different uh, take on it or if it's actually a different type of uh, discourse. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead. We're going to start in verse 11 of Luke 17. Father, we thank you for this time we have together, and we ask you to open our eyes to what your Spirit has for us. Because this is a very important passage in many respects, and it teaches us not only to look up for your, for your return, also tells us not to obsess over it that even though we're waiting your return, we still need to do our job. And Father, we thank you again for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Luke 17, starting in verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Where were there not ten cleansed? Where are they nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, we do not know exactly where this miracle occurred. It was just in the border region between Samaria and Galilee. But what Luke did consider important that Jesus was still on his way to Jerusalem. Okay? He's still saying, Jesus is still headed there. Of course, he's setting things up for the death, his death and resurrection. Now, this village, it was there. And we've talked about leprosy before. When you're a leper, it doesn't matter where you came from. You're all basically unclean. You all gather together because, as they say, misery loves company. Okay, And according to the law, and this is applied both to the Samaritans as well as the Jews, you kept your distance. And at any time, if anybody got within like 10 feet of you, you had to start yelling, unclean, unclean. Okay, put on your mask. No, they didn't say that, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't say that. <laughs> See if you're awake. <laughs> but essentially, you know, that they were warning people. This, this was out of courtesy. You don't want what we have. So keep your distance. And they still at that point didn't know really, really caused um, leprosy. You know, now it's just poor hygiene. But they made sure no one came cl close to them and you weren't even supposed to breathe the same air, even if you didn't touch them. So they, it's about 10 foot distance. They kept away. And they're coming up, and the thing is, under normal conditions, lepers are basically without hope. It is a prolonged death sentence. Okay, If you've got leprosy, even though there were provisions in the law for you to be healed and to be certified as healed, it didn't happen very often, Okay, if at all. And so you basically looked ahead at a shortened life, but still very long, of fingers starting to drop off because nerve endings are starting to die, gangrene setting in. Sometimes you'll, you'll be doing something and you'll actually injure yourself and not know it. And so there's a major infection. And eventually you die away from your family, alone, in the presence of other people like yourself. So there's not a lot of hope uh, in a leper colony. But obviously these guys listened. They were aware of Jesus and they were aware that Jesus did heal lepers. So what did they do? They cried out to him, keeping their distance, making sure that he heard them. They just wanted pity. Okay? All they, what did they say? Heal us? No. Have mercy on us. Okay? Have mercy on us. And Jesus was willing. He, you know, he saw people in, with issues, people in danger, people who needed help. He helped them. He would never sit there and say, 
no, I've healed enough lepers. Sorry, you guys, your luck ran out. No, he basically said, go ahead. And we're gonna, he's going to use this as an object lesson to the disciples about thankfulness. So here they are. They're crying for mercy. They call him master. And this word in Greek basically means chief commander. It's, a sim, it's a similar to a word that a Roman soldier would address a centurion as a master. That he's, he's the senior guy in charge. He's the one who can make or break a man. So they knew that Jesus was totally in command even of disease and death. And this is what makes this story so poignant, is they weren't even asking for help. They just wanted mercy, and they, but they had enough faith in their hearts to know that he could do this. Because he's the master of the disease, and he's the master of death. They've heard all this. So Jesus didn't say, make this big old thing, it's okay, be healed, and so forth. He basically said, you need to go and present yourself to the priest. Okay? Go wherever you're local, uh, you know, go to Jerusalem if you're not Samaritan, go to Samaria if you are Samaritan. Wherever you go for the priest, have him look you over. That's all he told him to go. Show yourselves. Because this was an act required by the law, and Jesus is also showing, you have faith, now act on it. Now notice he didn't heal them at that point. Okay, they were still lepers when he says, go to the, go and visit the priest. So they turn, they went off, and suddenly they were healed. And trust me, they knew it. Okay, and like I said, if you've had missing fingers or this, 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 usually it was kind of reddish or white from dead skin, so forth. Suddenly you look down at your hand, and it's, I got five fingers again. Wow. And that's what they're looking at. They, they, they waited. Once they obeyed, they used their faith. Once they obeyed, their faith was fulfilled because he had cured them. And you would expect all ten of them to come back and say, Oh, Master, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're heading on to the priest now. Thank you. We'll see you later. Thanks again. But it's interesting that none of them did, except for one, and he wasn't even a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Okay? This is very, again, to Jews, this is the ultimate insult to be trumped by a Samaritan. And Jesus had no problem with that because these, a lot of these Samaritans had a lot better faith than a lot of the Jews. Okay? And it's true, these guys who are healed, you know, I'll be honest, we shouldn't be really too hard on them. Okay? Because they were under a command. Let's go to the priest. And what I see here is that the Samaritan probably had a little bit more faith than the other t nine did. Because I'm willing to bet that the other nine probably didn't say, oh, wow, we're healed. Well, yeah, let's go. I'm thinking they're saying, wow, we're healed. Let's get to the priest and make sure this isn't, this isn't a fake. Let's make sure this is legit. You know, I see it. I'm having a hard time believing this. Let's go find out. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot of that is what, what was, you know, why they were so anxious to get on to the priest. Not because they were ungrateful, but they were unsure. Okay, a lot of times they kind of get demonized as, oh, there was ungrateful lepers. They should, they, should, they should have been smitten with leprosy again for that lack of belief. No, they were following orders. And even though they should have come back and, and thanked Jesus, the Samaritan did, and he was blessed by it, let's give them a little slack. I mean, it's true, they probably should have been very thankful. I mean, to be honest, um, I was thinking, you know, maybe they should have got together like a barbershop quartet. Well, it's not quartet. What is it? Nine people together. And started singing a chorus out of Psalm 103. Let me read that to you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. They should have. That should have been a great time for them. And they missed it, but they were still healed. And that's the beauty of grace. 
okay, you didn't show proper thanks. It's not like, well, give it back to me. Jesus says, I still love you. You still needed help. Go in peace. Go to talk to the priest. You're fine. I mean, sometimes, too, we need to ask ourselves a question. Okay, we're real, you know, people can get real judgmental about this. But how often do we take our blessings for granted? And how often do we fail to thank the Lord for something he's done for us? Okay? When we pray, a lot of times, you know, we, 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 you know we're, we're on our knees when the bad things are happening. And we're saying, Lord, I need your help. This is what's happening. I need this or we need that or whatever. We should be just as often on our knees saying, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this wonderful place we live in. Thank you for the provision you've given to us. Thank you for a day, another day not promised. Thank you for all of this. Instead of going to him when you need help. Okay? But humans being humans, that doesn't come naturally. We always run for help when things get bad. We're supposed to. But that's a habit we need to form to be thankful when things are going great. And especially if we see a miracle occur. Okay? Oftentimes you see something, you know, we're asked to pray for somebody, and we pray and we pray, and then suddenly, boom, our prayers are answered. Wow, this healing took place, or this person came to God, or whatever the case happened, they're here. When are we thanking God for that? Some people do. A lot of people don't. Lord, thank you. And then that's the end of it. No, praise him. Get down there. Just as much as you're crying out for help, cry out and praise as well. We need to enjoy the gift and not forget the giver. Be quick to pray and be as quick to praise. That's why when you think about the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, the first thing out of the mouth is praise. Okay, now again, it's it's not a it, yeah, it's true, it's a prayer, but it's not meant to be a rope prayer that you you know you pray while the ship's sinking or you know whatever great disaster is happening as you see in the movies. You know, yeah, we're going down. We better say a prayer. So what they do? Everybody trots out the Lord's prayer as they're sinking into the you know the Titanic's going into the water. That's not what it was intended to be. It was intended to be a model. And the model was, praise God first. Okay? Praise God first. Okay? And it's interesting, the psalmist in Psalm 107, and he repeats it four times, has this, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Not saying men do this, it's saying, oh, that men would do this that this becomes a new habit. So Samaritan comes back. He's giving glory to God. He's falling at Jesus' feet. He's giving him thanks and praise. And again, he could have followed the, the, the example of the other nine. But I think, as I said before, he had just that little bit more faith to realize, I don't need a priest to tell me I'm healed. I am healed. It's done. I can see it with my own eyes. And it's interesting because the Lord was pleased with it. Even though the Mosaic Law said that you had to do all these other sacrifices, it's like, well, it's true you could do that, that, but this, this is the fruit of faith. Okay? Obedience is better than sacrifice, but this idea of faith showing and stopping everything, even what you're supposed to do to give thanks for a miracle, that was such a blessed event, and Jesus was more than happy to say, wow, this is, this is amazing. Instead of going to a priest, this Samaritan basically became a priest, and he built his altar at the feet of Jesus. That's what he was supposed to do. And he received something greater than physical healing. Okay, Because notice he says, your faith has saved you, this is the same words that Jesus spoke to that woman who was washing his feet. Remember we talked about that a few, few uh, a couple months ago, a few months ago? He was at a Pharisee's dinner and he was there at the table and a woman who was a noted sinner, 
they knew exactly who she was. She came up and started washing Jesus' feet. And of course, the Pharisee host is sitting there saying, well, if he only knew what this person did and how horrible she was, he wouldn't want her to touch him. And what was his words? Your faith has saved you, which spoke of to her of that her sins had been forgiven. And the same words were spoken to the Samaritan who basically were saying the same thing. You got physical healing, but guess what? You got spiritual healing as well. Okay? And he was declared saved by the Son of God. It's wonderful to experience the miracle of physical healing. Any of us who've been through that and been sick, then suddenly we're well again because of something we've done. And the, what, not nothing we've done, but because of a prayer and the Lord has healed us. That's wonderful. That's great. But it is much more wonderful to experience the miracle of eternal salvation. That is just so beautiful. And those of us remember almost as much as anything that day we gave our lives to Christ the first time. Okay, I know people who know the exact date and time. Okay, I remember the place. I remember the year. I remember what happened. That's very true. But I'm not that organized in my brain. But it's a special event nonetheless. And you just think about, oh, how wonderful that was. Like the song said, I once was lost and now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Every child of God, all of us, need to cultivate that grace of gratitude because it not only opens up our heart to further blessings, it glorifies and pleases the Father. And there's a other side to that. An unthankful heart can be fertile soil for all kinds of sin. Okay? It's just a little warning that goes with that. There's the good, but there's also a warning there. So, moving on, let's continue with verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, See here, or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be coming in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate and drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that in, in that night, there will, be no, there, will, there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Then they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Okay, there's a lot here. So we'll take some time going through it. The discussion that came up, the Pharisees coming up and saying, When is the kingdom of God coming? This question was and is important both to the Pharisees and to the Christians, not only now, but back in Luke's day. Because this was bandied about an awful lot in Christian circles. But they were different for different reasons. They were important for different reasons. Okay? 
Now the Jewish people lived in an excited atmosphere expecting that the Messiah was going to come at any moment someone who basically was like Moses, a second Moses, if you will, who was going to free them from the bondage of Rome. Okay? As Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem, they're coming up to the Passover, and that's what the Passover celebrated, was Jesus's, or was the Exodus, not Jesus's, the Jewish Exodus from Egypt. God sent the deliverer, Moses, they were taken out of Egypt, set up in their own land. And they're saying, there's going to prophecy confirms this, there's going to be another one like Moses who's going to lead them out of bondage. But they didn't understand what they were, what was being referred to. They weren't talking about the bondage of Rome or any other empire. They are talking about the bondage of sin. But they didn't see that. All they could see was the here and now. They didn't like being under the Romans. Someone was supposed to come. Now first you had John the Baptist. They thought maybe this is the deliverer. He seems to be saying the right things, but he really never moved from the Jordan River until he was arrested and beheaded by Herod. Okay, now there's Jesus, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way there, and perhaps this is the time the kingdom was going to be established. Now the Pharisees, being the custodians of the law, had a right to ask Jesus when he thought that the kingdom was going to appear. Okay? And it, didn't, it was perfectly normal for this conversation to take place in public. It was very common to, for the different uh, brains of the time, the, the wise men, to discuss all these things. And everybody would sit and listen and say, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. You know, probably not understanding half of what was being said. But it was still done there for everybody's, um, for everybody's benefit. And Jesus gave them an answer. Now, it was a rather interesting little answer because in many ways he was repeating himself. He's basically saying the kingdom was already present. Remember he said that before. I'm before you. It's here. Okay? But he's indicating, he's going to tell a parable that the full expression of the kingdom has not yet taken place. It's starting. Jesus is here. The beginning of the plan to establish the kingdom has started, but it hasn't taken place completely. Now, he didn't go on with the Pharisees. He turned to his disciples like, Let's, let me give you some details about this. For example, he mentioned the word observation in verse 20. It will not come of observation. Now, that word that's translated as observation is only used here. This is the only place you'll find it in the New Testament. And in classical Greek, it means to observe the future by signs. Okay? So it carries the idea of spying or lying in wait or even some type of investigation, usually it's of a scientific nature. And what Jesus is telling them is God's kingdom is not going to come with this outward show saying, here it comes, here it is. So people could sit there and say, look, there it is, it's happening, it's coming, oh yeah, here it is, wait, it's coming through the door now, boom, it's here. No, he says it's not an observable process. It is going to happen suddenly. And he uses an example like lightning. As it shines in the, uh, in, well, let's see, shines in the east and off to the west, it's everywhere. Everyone's going to see it, everyone's going to know it, there's going to be no doubt in anyone's mind. Okay? It's not going to be in private. Okay? Oh, yeah, we have to go to the, yeah, as it says in Matthew 24, we have to go to the secret chambers to see him. Or we have to do this or go some other place out in the wilderness. He's saying this isn't happening. And what's kind of sad is that he's telling this to the disciples, but the Pharisees' question, though it was legitimate, they had missed the whole point. For Jesus had been there for some, what, three years? And they were still in the dark about what it was. They didn't understand who Jesus was, what he was seeking to accomplish, and to be honest, they didn't care. They didn't want to know. Their views, because their views were political. They were looking for a political leader to lead them to political freedom. They weren't interested in a spiritual revival or a spiritual leader. And they looked at it, it had to be Jewish only. 
Whereas Jesus was saying, no, this is not just Jewish. This is everyone. Why else was he, would he heal Samaritans? Or in one case, a woman who wasn't even from Israel. Okay, a Canaanite or a, uh, basically a Lebanese woman from way out there. She, he ignored her until she says, hey, I'm asking you. And yeah, I shouldn't feed food to the dogs. He says, yeah, but the dogs still eat the crumbs. And he turned around and says, you know, I have not seen faith like this. Healed her daughter. Think of the Roman centurion. The enemy. The big bad. He has, a, he has a servant who's sick, who's dying. Does Jesus care about that? No. Here, I'll go and I will go and heal him. And the centurion says, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. He mentioned his military experience. I'm under authority, just like you. He recognized that Jesus was under authority. He came from a higher authority. He recognized that. He says, I tell one guy, come. He comes. I tell another guy, go. He goes. Do this. And he does it. He says, all you have to do is speak the word. My servant's going to be healed. Again, non-Jewish, great faith, and it was done. And, of course, the powers that be within the Jewish religion were completely offended by this because that wasn't within their worldview. So Jesus is here. He's not denying that there's going to be a future earthly kingdom, but the importance of the spiritual kingdom that could only be entered through a new birth. Okay? Now... There's a little statement here. The kingdom of God is within you that a lot of people don't understand. Okay, And a lot of it may be it just wasn't translated correctly. Okay, Because the word in Greek, there's a preposition here that actually means not just within, but it means among or in the midst of. Okay, So one reasonable interpretation of this statement is Jesus saying, don't look for the kingdom out there until you have it first in your heart in here. That's what he meant by is within you. Okay? At the same time, he may have also been saying, the fact that I am here in your midst is what's important. For I am the king. And how can you enter the kingdom if you reject the king? Both are valid interpretations of this. He certainly wasn't saying that the kingdom was in the hearts of the unbelieving Pharisees. That definitely is not how you, you would uh, look at that because they didn't believe. It wasn't there. See, these Pharisees, they were so preoccupied with the great events of the future and their own power in association with it that they were ignoring the opportunities of the present time. So he's going back to the disciples. Okay, These guys, they got their answer. That's enough for them. Now let's talk more about this. And one of the warnings he has is, don't become so obsessed with my return. Okay, A lot of people, and this is a good warning for people who are really fascinated by prophecy, and I shouldn't say fascinated, I should say obsessed with Bible prophecy. And I know a lot. Okay, Every little thing that happens... They're saying, oh, this is a sign, and this is what's happening. And it's like, well, yeah, that's true. I'm not going to argue that issue. The signs of Christ's second coming are all around us. But what happens is they become so focused on the signs that they stop doing what they're supposed to do. You're supposed to, if you see that the time is short, what are you supposed to do? Preach the word. Go out, share your faith, because if the time is short, that means there is going to be a zero hour, and you're going to be taken away in the rapture, and it's going to be really bad for that person that didn't get saved. Now, they very likely could get saved. The opportunities will be, exist during the, the Great Tribulation for people to be saved, but it's not going to be easy, and a lot of them aren't going to stick to it because... The world is now against them and now can do something about it. Okay, When the Holy Spirit is removed from the scene with the rapture of the church, then, as the word tells us, the man of perdition, the Antichrist, the one who's basically going to bring judgment upon the earth and just open a free-for-all of sinning to everybody, they, he will be able to defeat whatever church is left on here. And that's people who are going to come to believe the faith after the rest of us are gone. Okay? 
it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a hard time. But people focus on that. Oh, I don't want to be caught up. I, I want to be, be, I don't want to be left behind. You know, you think of the books left behind. I don't want that to happen. I, 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 I we see it happening. We got the wrong president. We need to get the right president. We we need to do this guy and do that. And, and oh, no, no, no. It's like, well, are you out preaching the word? Well, no, no, I have to. No, no. Look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Yes, that's what you should be doing. But keep in mind, you have a job. We are like those servants. Master goes away. There's a couple of par uh, parables we went through. Same story. Is the master went away a long journey and they were supposed to continue doing their job as if he was there until he returned and those that did their job and think of the parable of the talents those that did their job and brought forth more to the kingdom well done good and faithful servant enter now into the joy of your lord okay but the one who is so focused on who knows what on fear basically i was afraid that I was going to lose the money, so I buried it. And here it is again. And it's, you know, to be, to give you my paraphrase of, of the master's response, it's like, that is the stupidest excuse I've ever heard. Because you could have taken that, put it in the bank, and at least I would have gotten 0.1% interest. Okay? Now, talent's worth quite a bit, so 0.1% interest, well, depending on how long he's gone, that's, that's a nice little chunk of change. Not a huge amount. It's not going to double or triple or anything like that. But it is still a gain. And yet you buried it. And we could apply that to this. Oh, you're so focused on my return that you didn't bother to go out and try to multiply the kingdom. Because all you would do is listen to the different podcasts. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to keep up on prophecy. Don't obsess with it. Don't obsess with it because you need to keep your eyes faced on what you're supposed to do. And that also means warning people. Okay? Um, we first off know, and we have to tell people because you've got a lot of people who say, oh no, the kingdom is not that visible. Okay? You had the Gnostics back in the New Testament times were saying you have to have special secret knowledge to understand what's going on. And he's saying, no, that's not true. Remember what he said about the lightning being visible everywhere. That's what it's going to be like. His coming is going to affect the whole world. So it's foolish to follow or believe anyone who is a false prophet saying, oh no, he's over here in this place or he's over there. Oh, you, you don't see him? Well, you just aren't ready for it. You have to be inducted into our system of religion in order to do something like that. Okay? It's a flash of lightning. And we do not know the hour or the day of his coming. Okay? There are people, and good people, good pastors that somehow forgot this point. And they will sit down and say, well, you know, I cracked the code, I did all the investigation to the signs, and Jesus is coming back, and he gives you not only a date and, uh, date and year, he gives you the time. You know, 247 and 68, or 48 seconds. Okay? And my response has always been, oh, thank you for telling me when he's not coming back. No man knows the day or the hour. So if you tell me a time, I know, well, that's not going to happen. That's not when it's going to happen. Okay? And he used some events out of the Old Testament to kind of show how unprepared people are, but how prepared we should be. Okay, the first one, of course, is the flood. And the second one was the destruction of Solomon, or Sodom, excuse me. And in both examples, both examples we read here, Jesus used and said it was business as usual for these people. They were caught unprepared. They had been warned. Now keep in mind, they had been warned. Noah spent 120 years preaching to him while he was building the ark. So they were warned what was about to happen. And we don't know, but the indication here is that Lot may have been a little more a little less wishy-washy than we give him credit for. He may have warned them as well. He obviously didn't do it too, he wasn't too strenuous about it. But there was a warning. There was a warning. And But they went on. They got married. You know, they're talking about you know marrying and giving in marriage and all this. They are just everyday activities. 
stuff that people normally do. Life goes on. And suddenly, and, and again, we talk about, you know, in on home group, we talk about Jeremiah, where God doesn't expect you to succeed in your ministry. He just expects you to do it. Well, here's another one. Noah's ministry. He did it. He preached. And only eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, only eight people were saved from the destruction that followed. Okay? And Lot, the signs of what was happening with Lot are very similar to what we have to deal with today. We go through the different scriptures. During the days of Noah, there was a population increase, a population explosion. Lawlessness was on the increase. And this is out of Genesis 6. You can look it up and find it. And the earth was given over to violence. Gee, sounds like 21st century America. Okay? Sounds like the world, to be honest, but let's, let's face it. And this sounds a lot like America. In Lot's day, the unnatural lusts of Sodom and Gomorrah were so abhorrent to God that he had to completely destroy the cities. But... Before he did, he took out the righteous people. Lot, and when we say righteous, I'm going to put that in quotes. Probably, relatively speaking, Lot, his two daughters, and his wife. But what happened to his wife? She looked back and was destroyed. So we get into verse 30, and we went through this, you know, here through Luke 17. We get into verse 30. What we see is a, is a description of, of what will occur when Jesus returns in judgment to defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom on earth. Okay? But here's something that's interesting. Most of this does apply to the Jews. Okay, talking about if you're in the hill, you know, and again, Matthew 24 talks about this. If you're on the house, don't go down, grab a cloak, just take off, head for the, you know, he who lives in Judea, flee for the mountains. Run for your lives. That's basically saying, and this is, paralleling that here. But what he's talking about here too is when Jesus comes for his church and takes to the heaven, it's going to happen instantaneously. It's not going to be a long, drawn-out process. And this is why we know these verses about being on the housetop do not apply to Christians. They apply specifically to the Jews. We don't need to worry about you know, wanting to go and get something in the house. As soon as we're taken up, that's the end of it. We don't care. Okay? But here's the thing. There still are going to be signs to know that we need to be prepared. And some people, and this is, this is kind of a sad point, some people may look and see those signs and thinking, oh Lord, don't come yet. Oh Lord, don't come yet. And there's others who, look, this is what's happening. This is what you need to do. This is what the Bible tells you. And then they sit there and say, mm, I don't know. I kind of like the way the life is right now. You know? I have all these possessions. I've got fairly well off, a nice house, a nice car. I don't really want to change. I, I like it the way it is. Remember his Lot's wife? She didn't want to leave either. She wanted to look back at her old life in Sodom. Didn't want to depart from it at all. And here's another thing. A lot of people, when they read through this verse, they think of one thing, but actually the verb, the Greek verb taken, in Luke 17, or Luke, excuse me, in verses 34 and 36, it doesn't mean taken to heaven. It means taken away in judgment. It's like, what? Yeah. Think about some movies when, uh, you know, you have a prisoner brought up when, and, and they're being dismissed. What do they say? Take them away. And that's the verse, that's the verb, the Greek verb here is they're taken for judgment. The person who has left is a believer who enters into the kingdom. For example, Noah and his family were left to enjoy a new beginning while the whole population of the earth was taken in the flood. Okay, In spite of their sins, Lot and his daughters were left, they were left out of Sodom while the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were taken when fire and brimstone destroyed the cities. This, a lot of people think, oh, that's, that's backwards. No, that's what the Greek tells us. Okay? And that's going to make sense as we go a little further on. And we know that this is going to happen, involve the whole world. 
a lot of people miss this one, when they talk about one group it's at night and another group it's at the day, but this is taking place simultaneously. Guess what? The Bible teaches around earth. Sorry, flat earthers. This is one of those things that shows, no, God knows what he's talking about. Because only on a round world can you have darkness on one side and light on another. Okay? The whole world is going to be involved with this because every eye is going to see him. And so, okay, some are taken, some are left. And, and so the disciples, they hear this three times, and they're saying, well, where are they going? Where are these people being taken? And the answer is, just as the eagles gather at a corpse, so the lost will be gathered together for judgment. Now that verse makes sense. A lot of people tangled with that. It's like, if they're t taken in the rapture to heaven, what has this got to do about a rotting corpse? It wasn't that is they were taken for judgment. And yeah, they gather where it's rotting. And how can, how can I justify that? Don't have to turn there, but let me read to you a description of the last battle in Revelation 19. Don't have to turn there if you, if you want. I'm just going to be reading out of uh, verse, or chapter 19, verse 17. And you will see the parallels here. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword, and which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all of the birds were filled with their flesh. So in other words... When Jesus returns to judge his enemies, there will be a separation of the saved and of the lost. Whether it be day or night, whether people are working or sleeping, the separation and the judgment, it will come. It is inevitable. Those who are saved will be left to enter the glorious kingdom, while those who are lost will be taken away in judgment. Now, as I mentioned, this a lot of this talking about being on a housetop and so forth. These verses apply to the Jews, apply to Israel in end times. But it goes back to being prepared. That's what the second lesson was all about, being prepared for believers to be ready when Jesus comes. Don't be like Lot's wife, that you, wanna, you don't want to leave. I mean, what's sad, and I think a lot of you will agree with me, there are many professed Christians today whose plans would be seriously interrupted if Jesus returned. And they would be resentful because of it. And we need to look at our own hearts and make sure we are not one of those. Yeah, I have plans. Okay, I, I want to see my daughters grow up. Lord willing, if you know I live long enough to see them get married and be able to give them away and see them have, you know, I'd like love to have grandkids. I mean, I'm one of the few retired people around here that doesn't have grandkids because none of my, you know, my two of my daughters are too too young and grandkids aren't on the horizon. My two boys, okay, that's okay. I'd like to see it, but if it's only because the Lord is going to tarry, if that's He does, fine. But on the other hand, if he comes tonight, that's okay. Because my girls will come with me. My family will come with me. Those of you part of the family of God, all of us will be up there, and instead of singing here with a uh, you know, piano and sound system, we're going to be with the ultimate sound system and, and band, worship band with all the angels of heaven. That's what's, you know, that's, what's so bad about that? Don't have, to pay, don't have to pay a car payment anymore. Well, I don't, but... You know, don't have to pay, but they pay the mortgage. Okay? Don't have to worry. We're there. We made it. This warning 
finds parallels elsewhere in the Gospels as a fundamental principle of Christian life. And that's why he says it, and he said it before, he will repeat it elsewhere. The only way to save your life is to lose it for the sake of Christ and the Gospel. That's it. No exceptions. And it's weird how Jesus is picturing civilization as a rotting corpse. But it's true. And as it rots, it's going to get really, really ripe. And when it gets really, really ripe, it's t going to be judgment time. And the discerning believer needs to see the evidence on the hand and realize the days of Noah and the days of Lot. This is not a future that is they are here. Okay? Does it mean we have to focus on it? No. But we need to be under the realization that the Lord can return for his church at any time. Don't focus on the signs. Don't sit there and say, oh, don't, 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 again, don't obsess over it. Know that it's coming. Know that you have a job to do. Know that you will not be found wanting by ignoring the signs or by obsessing over them and being basically paralyzed, not knowing what to do next. As these things come to pass, we know it's going to happen. And again, I say it many times, look up. Our redemption is drawing near. And not only should we be looking forward to seeing him and looking for his return, we really want, should be wanting to see him come. We want that. That is what we're here for. There's a lot here. And we, we got quite a bit out of it. And I think when we do a, a study through Matthew, we'll go into this a lot deeper. But it's a lesson we all need to remember, is that we have to uh, expect that each breath should be our last. Not because I'm a fatalist, not because I'm thinking we're all going to die, though if the Lord tarries, that is going to happen. Okay, But I'm thinking, no, because Christ could come back every minute. And you breathe in a breath, and then, boom, wow, what happened? We're here. We made it. We all want to make it. Father, we thank you again for this promise of your return made possible by the death and resurrection of Christ on the cross that forgive us of our sins and make us basically part of your, the body of Christ, one with you, Father. So when we see you again face to face, we're not scared, we're not worried. We'll just be in awe of your love and want to respond in love in the best way we can. And we don't know what it's like up there, Father. There's been a lot of songs, a lot of poetry that talks about heaven, streets of gold, you know, all the rest. We don't know. But we don't need to know because we, we use our faith to zero in on what is important, that we are your servants and that we need to do your will. And Father, we thank you that you've given us that privilege and that honor and give us the heart, the spirit to do the job so that when that time comes, we will stand before you knowing that you will tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. So Father, we again ask your blessing on our fellowship tonight. We ask you once again to just give us traveling mercies as we head home. Give us spiritual eyes to see the opportunities around us to spread the gospel, to bring people to your word and to salvation, not for our glory, not for church growth, but for the kingdom of God, because the time is indeed short. We praise you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Next week, chapter 18. So, y'all have a great night.